The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the 12th chapter of Luke's Gospel. Luke chapter 12. We'll be reading verses 49 through 56 there. Luke chapter 12, beginning with verse 49. I came to bring fire to the earth, and oh, how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I've come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided. Three against two and two against three, they will be divided. Father against son and son against father. Mother against daughter and daughter against mother. Mother Mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, When you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, it is going to rain. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky. But why do you not know how to interpret the present time? May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, we pray for ears to hear, eyes that see, hearts that are open, hands and feet ready and willing to answer your call. As we listen now for your words, help us to hear them, Lord. Help us to hear them that we may do what you call us to do, so that we may be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. It's a short, two-drawered, wooden file cabinet that sits in my office. It serves to hold an electric kettle and a thrown-together tea service for my afternoon tea at about 2 o'clock. Yeah, if you want to come by. I've usually got some Earl Grey or Lady Grey and a little sugar and maybe some milk. But it also serves to to hold some hanging files and the papers that fill them. And the top drawer of that file cabinet, to be honest, doesn't hold much. Just a few spare hanging files, some boxes of black tea, a few manila folders. The bottom drawer, however, is a different story. In that drawer, in neatly organized rows of hanging files, is every sermon I've ever written. Fifteen years' worth of manuscripts and note pages and scraps of paper, all divided by books of the Bible, all 66 of them, some in in more than just groups. And while they're mostly just stapled together pages of manuscripts, each stapled and filed every Tuesday morning after they've been preached on Sunday, there are also dozens of 5 by 7 note cards and 5 by 7 8 uh, 5 by 7 cards typed in detailed notes, a few uh, one-page printed note sheets, and a handful of written sermon notes. In fact, one day recently I found just a sheet of, I torn off a legal pad and in handwritten a short little homily I preached on the radio back in back home. It's interesting to notice, if you were to pull out that drawer, how those hundreds of sheets of paper have been filed. The hanging folder marked Torah, Genesis to Deuteronomy. There's a healthy number of sermons there, yet not as many that are in the file marked Prophets. The files on the Psalms and the history books of the Old Testament are perhaps surprisingly thin, but it really shouldn't surprise anyone, though, that a Christian preacher's sermon catalog is a little bit heavy on the New Testament. I have to say it's a bit thin toward the back in the little file marked Revelation. Without question, though, the thickest file in that drawer, thicker than most of the other files put together, is the file that contains all the printed manuscripts and notes that I've written over the years on the Gospel of Luke. Now, I could tell you I've preached more from Luke's Gospel because the the lectionary is a little kinder to Luke, giving it its own year, the year we're in now, 
The Revised Common Lectionary is an ecumenical guide for preaching through the year that I use to plan my sermons every year. But that's not the whole of it for me. I could tell you I preach more from Luke's Gospel because I have a better grasp of Luke's use of the Greek, but I can't lie in the pulpit. It's not true. I barely have a grasp of the Greek at all. Barely have a grasp of English, and some of you might say. Uh, but Mark's Greek is a little easier for me to understand. No, it's not because of that. The truth is, I, I preach a lot from Luke because of the four Gospels, I suppose I like Luke's version of Jesus the best. I mean, Luke's telling is the one with all the parables. Those wonderful riddles Jesus uses to describe the kingdom of God. Stories that turn all of our ideas about righteousness, religion, a God on our heads while also revealing more about us in the process. Luke's Jesus comes with all the grounded reality of Mark's, but there's also this wonderful exemplification of women, of children, of outcasts. And I suppose one of the reasons I really like Luke's version of Jesus is because in Luke, Jesus is always eating. <laughs> I like a Jesus that eats. Not only that, when he's eating, he's always welcoming sinners to eat at the table with him. No matter who they are, no matter where they come from, no matter if they've washed their hands or their feet. I suppose I've always liked Luke's telling just a little bit better too, because it's the Jesus in Luke's gospel that is always calling out the rich for their selfishness. Holding up wealth is one of the key contributions of injustice. I like Luke's Jesus because when he preaches his sermon, he doesn't stand up on a mount, but rather Luke's Jesus stands literally on the level place to deliver his sermon. And while Matthew's Jesus spiritualizes the Beatitudes, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Luke doesn't give Jesus that. Luke, Jesus as Luke says, blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who are hungry. Those who literally have nothing. I guess you could say Luke's Jesus seems to be the more compassionate of the Jesus of the four Gospels. Mark seems to be just on a, on a one-way path to the cross. Matthew seems to be establishing a new Moses. And John has this great, this great logos, this spiritual Jesus who walks around like Charlton Heston in the Ten Commandments, always looking out in the middle distance, speaking these very mysterious sort of words. But Luke's Jesus. Luke's Jesus is the one who makes room at the table for everyone, who bids all to come into the party, Luke's Jesus is the one who welcomes back the prodigal son. Which is why I suppose the text in front of us seems so dissonant. And for all the sermons in my file on Luke's Gospel, there isn't so much as a faded post-it note on this text. I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress am I under until it is completed? Do you think I've come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. I don't like it. I don't like those words one bit. I don't like them because I don't want them to be true. I don't want to believe that Jesus came to start trouble. That Jesus came to stir the pot, to cause division, to set folks on edge and cause discomfort. I don't like that. I want to find a way to erase these words from Jesus, to wash them out of my Bible, to replace them with words that remind me that Jesus is, as we often sing at Christmas time, the Prince of Peace. I want a better translation. Maybe that's it. I want a better translation of these words because they're just too problematic for me. You see, I, I value peace in the world, peace in the community, peace in the home. I think peace ought to be one of the highest aspirations of every follower of Jesus. But then Jesus goes and says something like this. You think I came to bring peace? No. Division. 
I don't like it. One might think that Jesus would, would clear up the whole thing with the words after, right? Sort of explain away the whole, I didn't come to bring peace but division talk, but no. Instead, Jesus says words that would get him run out of most places, most communities where harmony is a high value. From now on, he says, five in one household will be divided. Three against two and two against three they will be divided. Father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Surely these can't be the words of Jesus, right? My Bible doesn't have red letters. Maybe yours does. Is it printed there? Surely these aren't the words. After all, isn't family a sacred institution? Talk of families all over our Christian culture, isn't it? It's in the commandments. Honor your father and mother. But here's Jesus. Luke's Jesus. From now on, five in one household will be divided. In Matthew's telling, it's even more stringent. I've come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother. Whoever loves their parents more than me isn't worthy of me. And whoever loves their kids more than me isn't worthy of me. What, what, what's gotten into Jesus? This isn't the Jesus I like in Luke's Gospel. I don't like it. I imagine, I imagine right after Jesus said all these words, that he had more than one of his disciples pull him aside, maybe sit him down, say something like, Now, Jesus, I I know you like to get all worked up about this sort of stuff. I know, I know you like to get passionate about it, but we didn't sign up for this. Get back to talking about being blessed, about healing people. Get back to doing that, Jesus. Telling those nice stories, calling out the sins in other people. Pass out food to a few thousand folks. We did it before. We do it again. Get back to doing that. That's what we're supposed to be doing, Jesus. If you keep it up with all this other stuff, folks will start wanting to find a new Messiah. Oh, I could hear it. I tell you, I just don't like it. I don't like what Jesus has to say here. I don't like it at all. I don't like it because I don't want to believe it. I don't like it because it's contrary to so much of what I believe and hold to be true about my faith, about my Jesus. I don't like it because it isn't what I want to hear. But you know the biggest reason I don't like it? You want to know? The biggest reason I want to skip these words, to like Thomas Jefferson and take a razor to the onion skin pages of my Bible and cut out the stuff that I don't like, to take a big magic marker and just mark right on through it. Do you know, do you know why I want to do that? What really troubles me about these words from Jesus is that they're true. And I know they're true. And I can't do a thing to change it. I know they're true, and you know they're true, because we know the rest of Jesus' story. Jesus came teaching. He came healing. He came feeding. He came welcoming. He didn't come swinging a sword. He didn't come leading an insurrection. And yet they came fully armed with swords to arrest him. Jesus came speaking the same message that can be found at the heart of the Hebrew Scriptures. Love God and your neighbor as yourself. Yet the ones who love to quote that Scripture and claim its authority hated Jesus. Jesus came speaking about life, what it really means to be alive, about eternal life in the kingdom of God that was closer than anything they could imagine. Jesus came so that they may live, and they killed Him. It wasn't that Jesus didn't come intending to bring peace. Rather, when one comes preaching peace, preaching the kingdom of God, when one comes making a way for peace, when one comes with a message of love and inclusion, you had better believe swords will be drawn. Because the message of the kingdom of God isn't one folks generally want to hear. Not the whole of it anyway. It's one one people don't want to hear because the truth is it calls out our inadequacies. 
Maybe that's why I don't like it. Because really, at the end of the day, Jesus is speaking to me. But the division that Jesus comes to bring is that division between me and my selfishness. To separate me from what I want so that I may cling tightly to what Christ wants. That message isn't one we want to hear because it shines a light on our shortcomings. It's a message we don't want to hear because it tells us that others are just the same. We are all the same. Not a single soul better than another. We are all just the same. No matter how hard we work to tell ourselves any different. We don't like to hear it. I don't like to hear these kinds of words from Jesus because really they betray my motives in life. My motives in religion. Jesus' words reveal the selfishness in me. Folks who value comfort over hard work of equality. Folks who value complacency over conviction. That's me. I'd rather be at peace and calm than have Jesus come and stir the pot. I'm satisfied with my slice of the pie, even if some people's plates are empty. Jesus didn't come to bring peace, he says, because peace doesn't just happen. It isn't a magic word to be spoken or a victory to be won by whoever has the biggest or the most swords. Peace is the product of hard, faithful work that comes through discomfort and a shaking up of the status quo. And those things, if only for a season, can produce discord, frustration, and in the worst cases, violence and terror and death. It's because deep down, deep down, even those who come preaching peace only really want it if they can get it their way. They had come before Jesus preaching the same thing. Peace to Israel, peace to Israel, so long as they get it their way. But the way of Jesus is so often counter to those ways. Jesus said, do not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. No, I tell you, rather division. And they will be divided. Because if we truly seek to follow Christ, to do what he calls us to do, to be who he calls us to be, it might set us up against our friends. It might set us up against our fathers who cling to comfort of a rose-colored past. It might set us up against our mothers who hope for a future of comfort and ease and safety rather than the boldness and risk-taking in following Jesus. It may drive a deep wedge between us and our families as they fail to understand, why, why are you so passionate about Jesus? Why do you care about hungry people? Why do you care about clothing people who are sick? Why do you care about loving your enemies? Why do you care about seeing the world transformed for Christ? And it may drive the deepest wedge between us and ourselves. Us and our selfishness. Because it may cause us to lose everything we've worked so hard to have. To give it away without condition or question. To strive to bring the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. It may cost us more than we have to spend. Cause us pain and anguish and loss. It may even cost us our own life. But don't be afraid. You wouldn't be the first. Jesus has been there. And he's still there. Jesus says, I came to bring fire to the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. A baptism with which to be baptized and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think I've come to bring peace? No, I tell you, but rather division. I don't like it. But I know it's true. And all I can do is pray. Pray for the strength to understand it and to persevere. Because in the end, the greatest division Christ will ever bring to any of us 
is that division between me and myself. Between me and my selfishness. Between me and the sin I seek to cling so tightly to. All I can do is pray. And I pray for you this morning that that division comes. The division that Christ creates between you and whatever it is that keeps you from him. That Christ brings that division to you this morning in a way that leaves you to where you cannot sit still any longer. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we trust that you have come to bring peace, but we hear hard words this morning. Words that say you've not come to bring peace, but division. Or give us the strength to understand it. To know that the greatest division you bring is between us and ourselves. Our sin, our selfishness. Help us, Lord, to give that up to you now. As we trust, Lord, that you came, that you spoke, that you died and rose again to bring that division between us and our sin, us and ourselves, that we may cling to you and you alone. And help us, Lord, to be strong when that clinging to you causes other division in our lives even division among our friends, our families, those that we love. Help us, Lord, to see you now. Holy Spirit, speak in our hearts in this time that we have put aside to respond to you. Speak, Holy Spirit. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.